Good evening and welcome to the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. I'm your host, Mary Kissel with Stevens. We're honored to have Ambassador O'Brien sharing tonight's discussion alongside our outstanding seminar members. Secretary Pompeo is off tonight. Uh, we're going to play some footage in the background here as I talk of that Chinese spy balloon that wafted over the United States from January 28th to February 4th, six decades after Sputnik, the space race is back. And it's about much more than scientific advancement as America's national security hangs in the balance. It's a big topic. It's a topic that doesn't get much attention in the press until the spy balloon. And now we're going to tackle it. So let's dive in. Ambassador O'Brien, I'm going to start with you. You, Secretary Pompeo, and others were given a special briefing on that very spy balloon. What did you learn that you're allowed to discuss? Well, first, uh, before addressing the briefing, uh, the spy, spy balloon was one heck of a provocation by the Chinese. It shows how little they think of us. Uh, they, they believe they're becoming the dominant power in the world. They have little to fear from the U.S. in their view. And so they violated our sovereignty in an egregious manner uh, and in a very open manner by, by floating a relatively slow spy balloon over the United States. What Secretary Pompeo and I learned in the briefing, and I do commend the Biden administration for bringing John Radcliffe and myself and Mike and uh, uh, Matt Pottinger into that briefing, was that the, the spy balloon lingered over our critical uh, components of our nuclear triad at, at the missile silos in Montana. It went down and covered uh, Air Force bases that have our uh, bomber fleet in Missouri. And then it ended up uh, taking photos of some sub pens of ours uh, that are uh, our boomer or our high class subs are in. So uh, they did this very deliberately. They had uh, total control over where the balloon went. This is not a balloon that, as the Chinese initially said, it blew off course. Uh, and uh, or it, was a, it was a fortunate wind uh, for the Chinese to blow right over all of our nuclear sites across the width and breadth of America. The second thing we learned is that they've done this before and they've been doing this around the world. It's a very well developed program. The uh, Chinese are looking at, at space at a high, high Earth orbit, <laughs> low Earth orbit, and, and, and the balloon and UAV space. <clears throat> Excuse me, where you can get uh, better video and, and more signals collection uh, with the balloons. And the, the last thing is they, they did not do this during the Trump administration. Uh, there was nothing of this order of magnitude. They did have some balloons that skirted uh, the continental United States and, and, and clipped Florida and Texas, uh, but there was nothing so brazen uh, in the Trump administration, and, and they confirmed uh, that, that we, we were not briefed or aware of it. So this is a, a, a new uh, development with the Chinese. It's brazen. It was meant to humiliate us, uh, to collect on us, and to show the world that uh, China is immune uh, from any retaliation by the U.S. And the, the fact that the only consequence to the, this brazen breach of our sovereignty was a canceled meeting in Beijing that was then rescheduled uh, between Blinken and Wang in Berlin or in Munich uh, a week or two later, uh, showed the Chinese that there would be very little consequence for taking this sort of action. And that's why we see the cranes now coming in with collection uh, uh, devices on, on cranes going to our ports. It's why they continue to buy farmland next to our military bases. And it's why they continue to collect with uh, uh, cell phone towers in the U.S. So until there's a consequence for the Chinese for their actions or their collection activities, uh, I think we're going to see more and more of this, and, and it's time for America to wake up. And I think that may be the silver lining of the balloon, because it's hard to explain the cranes, hard to explain cell towers, but every American understood exactly what happened when a balloon with three school buses full of collection equipment flew over our country. And, and I think the American people are waking up to the threat posed by communist China. Well, certainly when we think about threats from the skies during the Nixon era, you were thinking about intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons, uh, satellites collecting uh, information um, on the United States. But you didn't really think about low tech balloons or that kind of near space area. I see that we've got uh, former Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger on um, Matt. Uh, just a big, broad question. Uh, you know, we started with the with the spy balloon that I think woke a lot of Americans up to this threat. Um, you know, can you give us a sense of the breadth of the threat from China 
when we're talking about things like space and near space capabilities? Well, you know, thanks, Mary. It's the, uh, the there are areas where China is moving ahead of the United States, and the, it's primarily in technologies that were first pioneered by American scientists. Uh, you know, uh, pilot tests of of new capabilities that were that were then discontinued in our budgets, but which China picked up on. You know, they, they sort of got a head start. They didn't have to imagine these these capabilities. They were able to let us imagine them, uh, to let us put the initial research and development dollars to work, uh, and then to get uh, uh, to to take it and run with it. I remember talking with. Um, uh, an American general uh, who had had spent time in Beijing, uh, who uh, told me the story of of how he uh, had heard that there was a uh, uh, a symposium going on in southern China, um, where they were uh, inviting Americans to come lecture on uh, cutting edge technologies, including hypersonics. This wasn't all that long ago. This was sort of you know. Um, it, you know, less than a decade ago, and and there was you know a whole lineup of Americans uh, uh, pre presenting the latest uh, information that they had and knew for things that they were testing theoretically, uh, or, or uh, and and so and, and you had a whole huge uh, team of Chinese uh, hosts who were who were carefully uh, recording and taking notes and and no doubt fetting these uh, the, these Americans. Uh, it reminds me of what another U.S. general told me, who said Americans are a lot like golden retrievers. We just we're, we're, we're friendly. <laughs> we're you know, if, if you ask us to go fetch something, we'll, we'll bring it and, and bring it to you. And that's sort of been the attitude for the last uh, 25 years. We've been we've been providing uh, things that probably should have been closely guarded secrets uh, in in the name of uh, you know friendly exchange and uh, in, in the interest of advancing science as opposed to thinking about our national security and who the other people were on the other side of the table and what their their real goals were. So anyway, I, I, I you know I, they're they're capable. I knew I knew virtually nothing about China's near space program when I was sitting uh, at, at the White House. Uh, and, uh, you know, have learned uh, really just in, in the weeks that have followed uh, that giant, uh, the red zeppelin that, that flew over Montana in our nuclear silos. Well, Alex Wong, uh, jump in here. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on what Matt said uh, and what the Chinese are doing to, uh, to, to, you know, steal our technology, but make advances in, in their kind of space-based and cyber-based warfare capabilities, this really has to go back to what might be called, you know, the, the first, uh, you know, space uh, technology enabled war, which was the Persian Gulf War. There, you know, we were using amazing technology, which was unknown to uh, to our enemies and really the world at the time called GPS technology uh, to direct our, our troops and really in, you know, 100 hours execute that war. The Chinese saw that. I mean, they say this, they saw that uh, capability on the part of the United States military. And ever since, they've been trying to build up their capabilities to uh, execute what they call and what is acknowledged now as informatized warfare. Uh, and going back to, to 2015, uh, uh, the, the, the Communist Party set up something called the Strategic Support Force. This was a, 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 a centralized uh, effort to, to bring together the capabilities of, sp of space and cyber to enable their war fighting capabilities uh, with information from space, not just GPS, uh, but targeting information, uh, communications among uh, you know various elements of their military across vast spaces, uh, ways to put at risk our space-based assets. Uh, you know we've responded as uh, as some of you know with with the space force created under the Trump administration, uh, and another effort to centralize our, our efforts. But this is a long time effort on the part of of, of the Chinese and on our part too to really take advantage of space-based assets to to enable informatized warfare. Uh, and and uh, that really is the next fight. And that really is uh, who can perfect this technology, who can utilize it, who can execute on the battlefield of this technology. That will determine uh, who has the upper hand. Well, it, it certainly is a new era. I want to put up a quote from uh, the 2022 National Defense Strategy, and it reads, quote, in the cyber and space domain, 
the risk of inadvertent escalation is particularly high due to unclear norms of behavior and escalation thresholds, complex domain interactions, and new capabilities, end quote. Bridge Colby, I'm going to come to you because what that quote, it raises an important question, which is, do we have rules of engagement? Does the United States know what to do when a, a, a Chinese spy balloon wafts over the middle of the nation at 60,000 feet, or if you have North Korean uh, uh, cyber hackers hacking a U.S. private entity, um, where are we in, in really thinking through you know, how to fight in these new domains? Well, thanks, Marianne. It's great to be uh, on the Nixon Seminar this evening, uh, at least East Coast time. Um, I mean, I think there were rules of the road actually set out. I mean, the Outer Space Treaty and other things during the Cold War, you know, in, in part under President Nixon's uh, tenure. But I mean, space is just dramatically transformed. I mean, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were really the only kind of entities, you know, states, but but certainly private companies able to operate in space. And today that's just totally different, as we all know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, and then this goes on. There's a whole lot going on in space and, and far less famous people, you know, uh, putting uh, smaller satellites into low Earth orbit and so forth. Um, you know, I mean, I think that the, the balloon crossing is, as Ambassador O'Brien, I think, rightly put it, that was a brazen act that is a clear violation of our territorial airspace and so forth. And it was the right thing to bring it down. I just think it should have been done sooner. Um, but I think what's different now is that space is really becoming almost a domain like, you know, obviously people can't just live out in space, so it is different. But I mean, in terms of how much we rely on it, uh, not only in the military domain, but in the civil domain for communications, for surveillance, for all kinds of data processing, et cetera. I mean, this is a, a much different uh, dynamic. And I, what I would say in the context of China is that space is critically important, and people sometimes say that, but it's not clear why. But think about it this way. I mean, God forbid if there's a conflict, we, the American forces, are going to be fighting five to 10,000 miles away from the lower 48. So if we're going to be able to control those forces to operate them, et cetera, we have to use space because essentially a lot of things are limited by line of sight or the curvature of the Earth. The Chinese, unfortunately, can operate largely from you know bases and, and, and entities on their home territory. So that gives them a huge advantage. So up until a couple of years ago, it was said, well, the Americans would be more reliant on space and China would use more what's called air breathing, you know, aircraft, radars, et cetera. Here's the troubling thing is that China's actually embarked on a massive, really, really, you know, formidable space buildup. And what that tells us, I think it's one of the most credible indicators of how China's ambitions are far greater than just Taiwan, because the reason for China to build up those satellite infrastructures, well, maybe it's to try to target an aircraft carrier. But a lot of this is about they want to know what's going on far away. They want to be able to control military forces that can project and sustain over long distances. Aircraft carriers, they're going to have half a dozen or so by the end of the decade. That's one of the really important things. So space is really going to be a very important for both sides. And in fact, a conflict could sort of start in space in ways we might not even appreciate. We might, Most of us might not even know about. Um, so that's one of the sort of really novel and, and you know, very dangerous elements of what's going on. I want to put up uh, another quote from General David Thompson. This is a interview. It's actually a summary of his comments uh, with an interview with Josh Rogan of the Washington Post. Uh, this is from 2021. Uh, the general said, and, and this is a summary, both China and Russia are regularly attacking U.S. satellites with non-kinetic means, including lasers, free radio frequency jammers, and cyber attacks. Um, so they're also uh, not just building these capabilities, as Bridge said, but they are also actively testing these capabilities. Kim, Kim Reed, um, you know, you you served in the administration and. Um, had a particular focus on this topic. Um, how serious do you see this threat? Bridge is, you know, talking about the buildup and and how it could be used. Do you agree with him? 
A absolutely. And uh, Mary, I come from this uh, from an economic perspective. I was with uh, uh, Ambassador O'Brien on December 20th, 2019 at Andrews Air Force Base uh, when the creation of the Space Force happened. And we've done very exciting things with our government uh, since that time. But it also takes private sector investment. I'm on the board of a, a, a great emerging growth space satellite company called Momentus. And uh, on that company is a former commander of the space station, Chris Hatfield. And uh, we're very focused on the future of space. And I really want to see America harness that private sector investment in every way possible. And I think working with our government is a way to do that. Uh, tomorrow's International Women's Day. And uh, as we look at what needs to happen for our future, I think it's workforce development in the space industrial base. And I really want to challenge all those young people who are watching this evening to think about space. Um, think about as World War II begun and the world uh, wars were fought with, uh, in the ocean with battleships. And then all of a sudden we introduced planes. Uh, during World War II, and that changed the trajectory. And what we've just witnessed over the past uh, few months uh, with China and with other countries, we need to be upping our game in every way. And so I hope Congress is investing, and I hope young people really think about this as a career. I also would like um, Ambassador O'Brien and others who are uh, national security experts to give their thoughts on these international convening efforts and what are we doing internationally, globally, to play out what China and Russia and other countries who might not necessarily have our interests at heart, uh, how are they playing out the future? And are we thinking about that um, through our network uh, as we head into things like the G7 in uh, in Japan? Thank you. Oh, Kim, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you raised the, the Space Force I encourage everybody to go to that website. It's um, it's pretty enticing. I, I mean, I'd like to join the Space Force if if I could, but unfortunately, I'm probably a little too far down that career path. Um, Alex Wong, uh, you said you wanted to to, to add to Kim's comments. Uh, over to you. Right. Yeah, I, I want to chime in to 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 uh, emphasize what what Kim said about the private sector. I mean, this is really an advantage that the United States has uh, versus every other country in the world, and in particular China, that we have. A vibrant uh, private sector uh, industry focused on 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 space launch, on putting cheaper, uh, more numerous satellites into low Earth orbit. Uh, this was uh, the, the the result of of a policy change to shift from a kind of centralized government focused NASA uh, focused uh, effort, uh, but also uh, you know the ingenuity of, of entrepreneurs and and and, and Bridge and and Matt have named a couple uh, that are very famous. But again, there are many of these companies that are just uh, uh, proliferating. And this is really a, a stark contrast to what we see in, in China. Now, China has made great investments in its space-based capabilities and technology and launch, but it's still very much um, uh, uh, centered on a, a government-dominated uh, and owned and operated launch uh, capability, as well as satellite uh, uh, construction. Uh, and even to the extent that they have some quote-unquote private sector companies, they are answerable to the Communist Party and controlled by them. So this is an advantage for us. If we do get into a situation where space-based assets are, are under threat, if we're in a conflict, the fact that we have numerous actors uh, uh, putting up uh, satellites into space, communication satellites into space, that they're doing it faster, that they're doing it cheaper, from, from they can do more of them, uh, that's an advantage for us. Now, there are some disadvantages to that, to that too. It, it's hard to coordinate. It's hard to... Uh, uh, to, to say that, uh, you know, to, to take control in a conflict situation of, of disparate private sector actors. There's questions of whether these private sector actors will have uh, divided interests because they don't just want to sell to American companies and the American government. They want to sell worldwide. These are all questions we can answer. But in the main, we have an advantage because of our, our private sector ingenuity. And it's something that the, the Chinese are trying to catch up on. And I, I'm not sure if they can. Well, you're raising again this question of, of rules of the road um, that uh, Bridge spoke to, um, you know, if we do have private sector actors, what are their uh, do's and don'ts? Who can and cannot they sell this technology to? Len He Chen, uh, great to have you back with us uh, on the seminar. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you and your institution 
are thinking about some of these issues? Well, it's great to be back, uh, first of all, and I just want to echo uh, what Alex and Kim said about the value, really, of what we're doing in terms of public-private partnership. That's an advantage that we have, certainly, over what the Chinese are doing. But, you know, one of the things I think it's important to recognize, and we've done some of this work in thinking about this at the Hoover Institution, is that this is not a new trend. Uh, China has been uh, extracting technology since uh, the 1990s. In fact, if you look back to the, the Cox report in 1998, uh, there was a specific articulation of how China was extracting essentially technology sharing that we had engaged in, in the commercial field and commercial sectors uh, to use it to advance their own military and, and space programs. And so the you know there's a tendency I think to view the threat from China as being a recent one, and, and that's certainly true. I think Alex raised a very good point, which is that their development with respect to the space program has been particularly robust over the last couple of years. You know they've now developed the ability to launch um, a rocket from a high altitude helium balloon, not unlike the kind of technology we saw drift over the United States at the end of January. They have the ability to get things not just into low Earth orbit, but they can actually travel. Uh, they're engaging in interplanetary efforts now as well. So a lot of this, our tendency to think of it as being recent, but the reality is this goes back many, many years. And the, the, the thing that's needed most, I think, is vigilance. Uh, our, our policymakers must be vigilant that this is a national effort that the Chinese are engaging in to continue to extract technology, to build a native space sector, uh, and they don't have the competitive advantage of private sector ingenuity. What they do have is the advantage of uh, taking technology from around the world and, and using it on their own. And so I think we need to be aware of that. We need to be attuned to that. And more importantly, we need to understand this in historical context. This is not a recent development, but something that's been going on for many, many years that we have the capacity and the ability to stop with the right uh, vigilance and the right activity on our end. You know, Lanny, I, I had to smile when you said uh, China is looking at interplanetary exploration. Of course, Nixon dealt with this, too. Um, uh, fun fact, the Soviets landed on Venus in 1972 uh, during his tenure. Uh, not many folks remember that, but uh, President Nixon and his team were also at that time uh, thinking about another adversary and uh, their efforts, uh, both uh, surveilling us from the skies, but as you say, too, uh, trying to travel the galaxy. Um, Robert O'Brien, um, I think many Americans were surprised when they saw that spy balloon. But as Lanny just so ably laid out, um, you know, this has been going on for a long time. And there's a lot of stuff floating around up there. Moreover, the Chinese... Um, aren't just using these things to surveil us and our friends and partners. Um, they have done things like, you know, try to shine uh, uh, lasers from the ground up at our satellites. They have attack satellites up there that they could potentially physically drive into our satellites. I mean, if you, you're talking to, you know, someone who's never really looked at this before, you know, what are the key areas that you think that the American people should should really know about and that our media should start, you know, really covering and talking more about. I think you're on mute. That's a great question, Mary. Thank you. And uh, look, I, I want to go back to something Kim said about uh, the formation of the Space Force. Uh, that was the first new branch of the military services, the armed forces since 19 uh, in 73 years. And at the time, there, were, there was bipartisan support for the NDAA, and there were some Democrats that had some vision and understood how important the Space Force was. But for the most part on the left and in the mainstream media, the Space Force was ridiculed as a you know, fantasy of the Trump administration. In the same way, I'll point out, because I'm, I'm one of the few people on the, the call old enough to remember, the way that, that SDI or Star Wars was uh, pejoratively uh, labeled and uh, when Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, I remember watching his, his announcement on TV, and immediately the the, uh, the news media branded Star Wars, and they, they talked about the Space Force as being Star Trek. Yeah, well, now the Space Force looks very visionary, and I think 50 years from now, when the heat of the partisan polarization that we're seeing in the country now dissipates, 
and, and real historians and serious men and women take a look at the accomplishments of the Trump administration, the, the, the launch of the Space Force on, on December 20th, 2019 uh, at Andrews, and it was a great event, is going to be remembered as one of the signal accomplishments of the Trump administration. Yeah, and it's so critical because the new high ground in, in the next war, it's not going to be trenches, it's not going to be aircraft carriers. The, the, you know, those, are, those will be important still, but it's going to be cyber and space. And one of the things we have to think about going to your question is, what, what did the Space Force inherit? Right now, the Space Force is primarily focused on ISR, surveillance, and reconnaissance, which is important, maintaining our GPS satellite system, which is critical, uh, and launching uh, satellites. What it's not so much focused on is offensive capabilities. And as you pointed out, the Chinese have extensive and the Russians have extensive uh, uh, capabilities. As the general pointed out in the, in the article you summarized, I'm not going to say anything about it uh, based on my personal knowledge, but I'll just refer to what the general said in that, in that article. Uh, there have been significant uh, uh, operations against U.S. satellites and against U.S. assets in space by our great power adversaries, China and Russia. And we, we need to make sure that uh, the Space Force not only continues to do a great job with launch and, and with surveillance and reconnaissance and, and maintaining the GPS system, but that we get our own offensive capability so that when the shooting starts, and as General Minifor, uh, Minahan said recently, that could happen as early as 2025. It could happen as early as 2024. Uh, if you, with the narrowing of the Davidson window in Taiwan, we need to be prepared to act offensively in space, not just defensively and not just as a surveillance platform. So that's one of the challenges that the Space Force will have going forward. I think it'll be met, uh, but we've got to take that very that, that, that challenge seriously. We need to get on it. It's a it's a as Churchill used to say uh, on things that were important, he'd stamp a, a stamp that said "Action this day" uh, on the memo or on the paper and send it back to the ministry. This is an action this day item. Uh, you know, and, and Bridge pointed that out, and, and you did as well, Mary. The, the question about the rules of the road that Kim raised and that you raised, look, we know how that's going to play out because we've seen it. And in some ways, the space treaties and, and space law is based on something called law of the sea, which has been a customary law since even pre-Roman times. Uh, we, we've developed this, this body of law. Some of it's treaty-based, and but most of it's customary. And the seas are, for the most part, international waters. And we see how the Chinese act. They they go into international waters. They've done this in the South China Sea, which is a massive, you know, uh, portion of the Pacific Ocean. And they built islands there. And and they said, first of all, this will be for civilian use. It's going to be for search and rescue. Uh, it's going to be uh, to to help fishermen. And what did they promptly do? They put landing strips on for for jet aircraft, for bombers, for fighter jets. Uh, they put missiles on them. They militarized them. They, they, they not only went into international waters and did this, but they went to the, the exclusive economic zones and territorial waters of other countries in the region. So when the, when the Chinese said that they're going to go to the moon for scientific purposes and, and they'll respect treaties, we know what will happen. When they get a base on the moon, they'll militarize it, just like they've done in the South China Sea and what they've probably done in the Arctic. Uh, we, we really don't know in the South Pole, but we, it's, it's likely that they've militarized their bases in the South Pole, totally contrary to international law. Uh, and they're going to do the same thing in space because they're going to follow the pattern of behavior they've engaged in from the start. So the U.S. and, and our allies and, and even countries that, that aren't allied with the U.S. but are concerned about the man's inheritance in space need to be, watch very carefully how the Chinese behave. And we need to be prepared immediately to counter anything they attempt to do on the moon, uh, uh, which we did not do in the South China Sea. We turned a blind eye to what happened in the South China Sea. We turned the other cheek and we thought, again, it was this idea of, if we just let the Chinese commit genocide against the Uyghurs, if we just ignore what they did to Tibet, if we just ignore what happened in the South China Sea, if we just let them steal a little bit more of our intellectual property, they'll get rich. And as they get rich, they'll become more liberal and they'll become more like us and they'll want to be like us. And it's going to be a great partnership. And, and uh, that's, that was a na naive view held over many administrations, Republican and Democrat, for the last 40, 50 years. And, and we can't have that same attitude going into space or we're going to lose the moon to the Chinese. And, and that, that will be the ultimate strategic high ground if there's ever a conflict in, in, uh, here or terrestrially on Earth. Well, it, it's, it's such a scary prospect. And again, I'm just amazed that it doesn't get uh, more attention in our, in our public square and in, in our press. Um, you know, one thing that you raised, uh, Ambassador, is the Chinese building things in international spaces, international waterways, the South Pole, potentially um, the moon. Um, but they also have partners 
uh, around the world um, that help them build facilities uh, that augment uh, their near space and space capabilities. Matt Pottinger, I'm going to put you uh, a little bit on the spot, um, maybe to, to, to address that question, because just as the United States has you know, space partnerships with NATO and other friendly nations, so too does China, right? Should we, shouldn't we be talking about that too? Yeah, well, look, we now have, uh, uh, between China, Russia, and Iran, we now have a proper axis. You, know? you might argue that the, the axis of evil that we heard about um, <clears throat> before was what wasn't uh, was evil enough but but not access enough we, we we've got um we've got a, a real access now uh, the um other countries that that are that are really close into that in the orbit um might include pakistan uh as well as um uh north korea although um they're they're a bit of a, a of a loose cannon even <laughs> even for for the chinese uh the um, I, I've been alarmed to see the degree to which South Africa has been, um, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that um, it, it really betrays sort of the uh, some of the traditions um, uh, of South Africa that they've aligned themselves so closely. Um, right now, their their military is training together with uh, with Russia and China as uh, as Russia prosecutes the largest war in Europe since 1945, perhaps soon with Chinese munitions and uh, and weaponry. Um, and and then there are, there are countries that are that are simply um, uh, not not aligned with China, but also not willing to uh, um, to stand up on principle, even the principle of sovereignty. Uh, and and uh, sometimes are willing to advance China's interests, um, even though they run counter to uh, to to uh, the rule of law and to sovereignty. Yeah, and it's interesting the nations that get caught up in this that you wouldn't necessarily think about. I uh, remember that we did a treaty with Luxembourg uh, during the Trump years on space cooperation and pooling our resources and you don't really necessarily think of Luxembourg as a place where you know you need to think about space but um actually it's quite quite important um bridge colby to Matt um, Mary, Mary let me just jump in there yeah, and, and please I, I agree with everything Matt just said but Argentina has a massive space tracking sa station uh for the Chinese for the PRC and uh and, and many many Chinese scientists and, and military officers are, are based in Argentina they're in places like Namibia uh, they're garnering, you know, advanced rocket technology from the South Africans, which had a, a quite an impressive uh, ro rocket and missile program uh, in the old South Africa. So, uh, Matt, Matt's correct, and you're correct that this is the, the Chinese are, are relying on one belt, one roads to to make inroads here in the, on the Earth terrestrially that are going to help them celestially, and uh, and so we need to really keep track of these countries, and and many of them. Are, are again, as you point out, are, and Matt points out, are ca counterintuitive. You wouldn't think the South Africans, with Nelson Mandela, who fought you know such a, a tremendous fight for freedom, uh, that they would turn a blind eye to what's happening to the, to the Uyghurs in China, for example, and, and and open up their you know to the Russians and the Chinese with open arms. So, you know, th this is a, a fight that's taking place in space, but it's also taking place here on the Earth. Yeah, it, it is ironic. I was speaking to a, a friend of mine who studies China and. She said to me, you know, they the South Africans and others saw Mao as you know supporting their liberation from the oppressors. So uh but you're right, it's it's completely counterintuitive that they would uh, side with the with the communist regime today. Um Bridge Colby, uh I was gonna go to you, but the national security advisor uh, goes on to you. So uh next next over to you. <laughs> Always a pleasure to be one up by Robert, uh, truly. So, um, no, I, I think this is a great discussion. I was going to just sort of add in on the on the technology issue. I mean, one of the things that I think is worth uh, considering that I think Lan He Chen uh, sort of referred to, and, and you know, is clearly the United States has enormous advantages in terms of the sort of creativity of our society and our system. You know, on the other hand, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, many of us have worked with them over the years, a very highly regarded uh, Australian think tank, 
has released a technology sort of assessment or kind of net assessment. And they found that China's ahead. I think they had a couple, I don't know, something under on the order of magnitude of almost 50 different areas. And the, the Chinese were ahead in, in, in a very substantial fraction, maybe two thirds or something like that, maybe even more. Now, one can quibble with the methodology, but I think it gives a sense of, you know, what's what we're dealing with. I mean, um, you know, clearly the United States has the ability with our indigenous population and also sort of skilled immigration to be able to get these centers of excellence, say, in, in the sort of Northern California, Texas, uh, increasingly Florida, I think. Um, but, you know, the Chinese are producing just, I think, orders, you know, I don't know if it's several, several multiples as many, you know, trained scientists and engineers every year. And there's the, the in, you know, when you talk about scale, I mean, you look at the diversification that, that some of the companies are trying to move towards India or, or the ASEAN countries, but the, you just can't, it's very difficult, almost impossible to replicate the kind of combination of sort of engineering capability and scale that the Chinese can produce, say, for, for Apple. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. I know Alex, I'm sure, knows, for instance, knows a lot more about this than I do. But, but I think there's a real question about, um, you know, I, I guess my view is I don't think we can take for granted that our system will outcompete the Chinese. Um, I, you know, I mean, if you look at the, the history of the Cold War and the arms race and the space race, Soviet, Soviet technology development was very impressive. There was theft, say, on the on the atomic bombs, but Soviet, you know, rocket production. I mean, we were just mentioning, Robert was mentioning, very capable, you know, again, and a lot of, a lot of our, um, a lot of our capability was also from, from people that, that, you know, uh, generally by voluntarily, but some of them, <laughs> Werner von Braun, uh, involuntarily, uh, we were able to take advantage of. Um, but I think the Chinese have a, have a scale and, and also a sort of capability across you know, the Soviets have, and the Russians have always concentrated on sort of the military elements of technology. I mean, they've always been relative, well, less today, obviously, as we're seeing, fortunately, but, you know, missiles, aircraft, uh, space satellites, these kinds of things. But the Chinese have clearly been able to to make a lot of progress. And I think we've, I think my impression is that we've moved beyond the period where they're relying on theft. I think theft is still part of the equation, but it's the minor key. Um, there's enough, uh, you know, indigenous sort of capability in the Chinese system. And I know, I think, Mary, you lived in Hong Kong, too. I mean, as a kid, I lived there. I know Matt lived in, I'm pretty sure lived in Hong Kong. I mean, there's an immense amount. I mean, that's a less of a technological as much as a financial center, but it gives you a sense of the sort of creativity. Now, obviously, the, the, the CCP's rule is going to put a cold, cold hand on that. But I, I, you know, my view is, I think, in the space, the space race, the cyber race, uh, computing, biotechnology. I mean, I think it's indicative, actually, that the administration has put on these restrictions. I think that's actually a relatively strong signal that the administration is concerned. I, I, think, the, I think the technology sanctions are one of the areas where the administration deserves the most applause. I mean, I think they've, they've, they've moved forward. And I, 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 bet, I, I don't want to speak for Robert and Matt, but I, I imagine you would agree that they've done a good job on that uh, relative to where we were even a few years ago. But that, that to me, actually signals a rightful concern about the pace of Chinese production. And I mean, one of the things I've been thinking of, you know, my, many of us, friend Neil Ferguson has pointed out that we may be in a sort of 1941 scenario with China, um, where, you know, of course, the, we put in an oil embargo on Japan and that helped sort of precipitate Japan's decision. One of the reasons I'm actually less concerned about that is I'm not sure how concerned the Chinese are about our ability to hold back their their semiconductor production. I am not an expert on that. I mean, I think we're all becoming a little bit expert on semiconductors, but there are many who know more. But I mean, my my, I mean, so we, we, I, 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 it's hard to say. Um, but I, I, I guess my bottom line here is, I mean, taking a look at the technology arms race. I mean, I think one of the things that made us so successful, and I'll kind of conclude on this point, during the Cold War, was never taking for granted that we would outcompete the Soviets. Um, and and yes, you know, in things like the Strategic Defense Initiative and other the the second offset strategy, um, there was always a sort of uh, a, a righteous and and uh, a sort of advisable fear that we were going to get out competed. And I think that's the right attitude to take today. Yeah, thank you, Bridge. Um, to your point, uh, you know, of the uh, severity of the threat. Uh, just to give our uh, viewers a taste of this. And this is what's so neat about the Nixon Foundation and the library. 
they have these wonderful documents from the Nixon era, and one of them uh, that was recently declassified in recent years was a national intelligence estimate about the Soviet space programs. And it contains a list of missile tests that the Soviets conducted during the Nixon era. And it's remarkable. It's, uh, you know, like rocket missile tests, you know, almost every other day. So if they were doing it back then, then you really have to wonder what the tempo is um, of those launches and tests today. Lan He Chen, I know that we're going to lose you in a couple of minutes. So I wanted to uh, throw it over to you to give a last word before you have to drop yeah. off. No, I, I appreciate that, Mary. I just wanted to validate an element of what Bridge raised, which I think is very important. And that is that the, the Chinese have an ability to use the power available to them to engage in the infrastructure investments they need to advance uh, various programs. So if you look, for example, at all of the different facilities they've developed over the last couple of years around China, they have these space and technology parks across the country. They have a number of suborbital launch sites, I think two or three. They've got a number of satellite launch sites separate from that. They continue to develop entire technology corridors that are dedicated to uh, space and near space uh, technology. They have the ability to deploy it in a way that uh, frankly, in the United States, we, we have a challenge. Uh, you know, here in California, we have an environmental impact review process that ties up any infrastructure development for decades. We can't even build water infrastructure, let alone space infrastructure. And, and so if you look at China, uh, I venture to guess, and, and others are more expert on this than me, I don't think they have an environmental uh, impact review study process. I don't think they have any study review process. I think they just do. Uh, and I think that gives them an advantage in some ways. And I think I think Bridge is, is very right to point out the fact that we can't take for granted that our public-private partnership is necessarily an advantage. I think there are elements of it that are advantageous for us, but um, the Chinese ability to to develop and grow native sectors that are national champions is something that uh, we we cannot take for granted. And and that's an area where I do fear. Unfortunately, our own systems, our own political and regulatory systems stand in the way of being more competitive. Well, and Mary, if I can just jump in there on something Lonnie just said, and I, I think he makes a great point, and, and he made it earlier. The, the Chinese are relentless. They, and as Bridge pointed out, they've got thousands of scientists coming out of you know, STEM. Is, they're not worried about uh, transgender studies in, in China. They're working on STEM uh, subjects. And they're, and they're turning out thousands of engineers and uh, and scientists every year out of their universities. And, and what they're able to do with, with that scale is to pursue an all-of-the-above approach. So when we think about what happened with the balloon, you know, Lon, he mentioned that they could launch a rocket from a balloon. Well, another thing they could do from the balloon very easily with the size of the balloon that floated over the U.S. just recently is put an EMP device on it that would create an electromagnetic pulse conventionally, short of a nuclear explosion, and, and operate you know below the nuclear threshold and yet have the same effect on us that, that a nuclear ex explosion in the atmosphere would, it would have and so that gives them you know they're, they're going to be coming at us with with UAVs that are solar powered they're going to be coming out at, at, at a high orbit or a high altitude they're going to come at us with high altitude balloons they're going to have low earth orbit uh, satellites they're going to have high earth orbit satellites and, and as Lon he pointed out, there are entire industries built around these things in, in China, whereas for the most part, we focus on one type of technology and figure out what the best is and, and try and perfect it and, and, and spend time polishing it and making sure it's great. And, and they're going to come at us with scale uh, and, and a quantity. As, as Stalin once said in a, in a war, you know, quantity has a quality all of its own. And the, the quantity of, of, of weapons that the Chinese are going to be able to throw at us in various different uh, you know, configurations is going to be quite astounding. It's going to present a, a tremendous challenge for Space Force and, and the rest of our armed forces and as American civilians, if heaven forbid, we're ever in a war with China. So I, I think we got to really take what Lon He and Alex and, and Bridge have pointed out, you know, about the scale of the Chinese efforts. I mean, they're, they're hardworking, they're clever as can be, uh, they're, they're motivated, they're, they're nationalistic. We, we, cannot, we cannot underestimate China as an adversary. We've never faced, even with the the Russians at their peak, and they had obviously huge scientific prowess, as you point out, with their their space program. But even Russia at its peak doesn't come close to what China is throwing at us. Now, I'm convinced we can win, but but we got to get on it if we are. 
Well, Ambassador, you're painting, a, a, a frankly, a, a deeply frightening portrait of the future of warfare and the future of a potential conflict um, between the free world and China. Kim, Kim Reed, um, you know, we've spent most of the discussion tonight in the seminar talking about China, but of course, um, I it, believe it was pointed out earlier, uh, you have others, uh, Matt Pottinger, uh, in fact, laid them out, uh, R- Russia, uh, Iran, um, Pakistan, um, with these kinds of capabilities. Should should we also not forget the Russias of the world, even as we focus on China? Absolutely, uh, Mary. And, uh, and Ambassador Brian, I believe, just said the word painting. And so since this is a seminar and we have friends of the Nixon Foundation, Nixon Library, I was on a a, a Zoom earlier today with a Heritage Foundation uh, expert, uh, Dr. Ted Bramund of the Margaret uh, Thatcher Center for Freedom. And we were talking about a wonderful book um, that Winston Churchill did uh, in his retirement called Painting as a Pastime. We know that he became an artist, but I want to just read this passage to you when we think about grand strategy from this book. To make a plan, thorough reconnaissance of the country where the battle is to be fought is needed. Its fields, its mountains, its rivers, its bridges, its trees, its flowers, its atmosphere, and I underscore atmosphere, all require and repay attentive observation from a special point of view. And and so uh, the United States does that. We do the best in the world at that, but we always need to do more and better. And that, as I mentioned, takes harnessing uh, the beauty of our free enterprise system in the private sector. Um, Just a few days ago, it was reported that a Chinese spacecraft, so we talk about balloons that uh, just happened uh, across our country from China. And so just a few days ago, a story appeared, Chinese spacecraft has been checking out U.S. satellites high above the Earth. The Chinese satellite TJS-3 has been inspecting other countries' assets in geostationary orbit. So like Winston Churchill said, we need to be looking at what's happening everywhere. And it's not only with China, it's with with, um, our partners and allies and our adversaries. Um, I also want to commend uh, one of our participants here, uh, Matt Pottinger, a week ago. He testified in uh, prime time before another member of our Nixon seminars hearing, very first debut hearing, the new House China Select Committee. And uh, Chairman Mike Gallagher did a great job. But Matt, I just want to say thank you for taking the points you raise here uh, to a global audience. And uh, we really appreciate that. And I know that this Select Committee on China is looking at this. And I know that other committees um, are considering this because it's uh, not only national uh, strategy and security, but it's economic. And uh, as we mentioned with South Africa, uh, I look every day at where China is investing. And it is in so many countries. I'm stunned every day I see it. And our country really needs to be uh, matching this and, uh, and defeating this in strategic ways with our partners and allies. I know we did a lot on this on uh, 5G. And we're working this on this on in space and satellite, but uh, so much more needs to happen. Thank you, Kim. Th- thank you so much for raising that select committee and 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 Matt's testimony there. I'd commend it uh, to everyone. It is uh, free to read uh, up on the House website. Um, Matt, let, let's go there uh, to to the select committee and to the politics of this a little bit. Um, Robert O'Brien uh, earlier uh, raised the. Um, pushback that Reagan had uh, when he wanted to implement a space-based uh, anti-missile system, uh, uh, Star Wars, so to speak. Um, are we seeing a coming together here in the United States, a realization that this threat is not partisan? And is the select committee a good first step forward? Is there something positive that we can say here? I, I, I definitely think it's a good step forward. I One of, one of the best things about that evening uh, was that if I had closed my eyes, most of the questions from members of Congress um, w- would have been indistinguishable, f- whether it was a Republican or a Democrat asking the questions. And a lot of the statements that those congressmen made 
um, were um, very much focused in a very serious way on our national security interest, not trying to score for the most part, you know, partisan shots. And so, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that the, the whole Congress is in the same place, but what it means is that you've got this almost sort of self-selected group of uh, people who are putting the country first, people who are uh, aware that we're facing the, the most significant national security challenge and challenger that we've ever faced. And um, and so there you have, uh, you know, a, 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 some of the words that people used uh, to describe the the, uh, the hearing in the days that followed, particularly referring to the members, not to the witnesses, was that it was professional, it was bipartisan, it was serious. The Washington Post wrote a great editorial. Uh, most of the criticism that I read was none of it could find a substantive thing to criticize. It was more sort of criticism of the idea that we're, we're in overinflating, uh, or you know that we're inflating the uh, the China threat. And so uh, that that's a, that's a a small beltway group that, that's getting lonelier and lonelier. I think um, uh, people from outside the beltway. Um, who, who took the time to watch that hearing uh, provided a lot of great feedback. So I think it's really important. This is this is a really important group of uh, of elected representatives of our country right now, both parties. I, I love those uh, adjectives: uh, professional, bipartisan, and serious. It's not uh, really words that you think of when you think of the United States Congress these days. So that, that's terrific to hear, Matt. Um, this seminar was advertised as talking mainly about space, but also other emerging areas of warfare, including um, near space, but also cyberspace, which probably deserves a seminar all on its own. But I do want to touch on that. Um, Alex Wong, um, you dealt uh, a little bit, a lot with the threats from places like North Korea, um, which is a cybersecurity issue, not just for uh, the United States government, but as we've learned for private actors, are we getting our arms around that? And is this another area that, you know, really deserves more public attention? Well, thanks, Mary, for bringing it up. Uh, you know, you mentioned cyber and we've been talking a lot about space, but they are connected. Uh, you know, the space-based assets enable a lot of cyber uh, uh, capabilities, information cap capabilities, whether in warfare or or kind of uh, gray zone activity or sub-warfare activities. Uh, you know, you mentioned North Korea, and and the the cyber threats out there are, are all different, and they operate at different levels. You know, North Korea, a lot of our chief concerns were the ability of their uh, cyber actors, their hackers, to uh, evade sanctions and you know basically steal from from banks, uh, uh, whether it was cryptocurrencies or whether it was actually just actual currency that they would then launder uh, in order to evade sanctions. That was one level of it, uh, but North Korea. China and Russia uh, as main adversaries in the cyber area, we, we worry about their, their ability to get at our critical infrastructure. And we worry about the uh, ability of, from a military standpoint of their uh, uh, of, of, of cyber and information warfare compromising uh, our war fighting systems if we actually get into a conflict. So this is operating at multiple levels. Now, the Chinese, you know, what I've been surprised by, look, you know, shifting from China to Russia, you know, Russia has you know, considerable cyber, offensive cyber capabilities, hacking capabilities, but very surprised that, that we haven't really seen that come to bear in, in a very effective way in, in Ukraine. Now, perhaps that was because we've built up our defenses. We've uh, worked with the Ukrainians to build up their defenses. We have ways in which they haven't been able to neutralize uh, the Ukraine's ability to to utilize space-based and cyber-based uh, capabilities in warfare. But I am surprised by that. So I'm curious to see what China is learning from this what other uh, uh, malign actors around the world are learning from the, the Russian example, whether they have to beef up their cyber capabilities for a warfare scenario. But we should always be looking at uh, our cyber defenses on critical infrastructure, forming better uh, uh, relationships between the private sector uh, and the government, as well as these, these whether it's, you know, you're a, you're a dam or you're a uh, you know, you're a distribution, uh, uh, you know, gas distribution company. These critical nodes of our, our infrastructure, we need to, to have a, a better uh, uh, and closely linked relationship between them and our government to make sure that they are not vulnerable 
to uh, to cyber attacks from our adversaries like China or Russia or North Korea. That's such an, an, an important point, Alex, and it um, just raises something that I think Ambassador O'Brien, um, you, you know, very uh, eloquently uh, explained, uh, which is that the, the U.S. homeland is under threat. And just to go back to where we started with the Chinese spy balloon, I think that became very obvious when uh, Americans from um, Montana to the Carolinas uh, looked up in the sky and said, wow, what's that thing floating over us? My goodness. I just don't think that we as Americans are accustomed to thinking that sitting here in our homes that we could be under threat. Um, Ambassador O'Brien, I, I, I want to go back to you on, on that topic because um, we have spent decades in this country feeling very, very safe. Um, is is that time over? And are we acting urgently enough if it is over? I think you're on mute, sir. Look, we've been very blessed, Mary, by, by having two great oceans separating us from most of the rest of the world and having good neighbors in Mexico and Canada. And uh, <clears throat> that's given us a complacency, uh, especially since the end of the Cold War. And we now have space and cyberspace that are the new high grounds that we're facing. But look, uh, so we've got to we've got to be taking this, these threats seriously. We have to have, show urgency and, and act with dispatch. But we also have to be optimistic, and and I'm I'm optimistic for a number of reasons uh, about our future and how this this ultimately plays out. Number one, I, I think as Matt pointed out, there's a a new emerging bipartisan consensus uh, about the threat we face, and as Americans come together. I'm convinced that uh, as we're united, we can't be defeated uh, by the Chinese or, or others. Number two, I think you're seeing the the, the caliber of people. And I, look, I, I look at this seminar. I look at Alex and Kim and Matt and and Bridge and Lon He and uh, uh, Mike Gallagher and Mike Waltz and, and yourself and and the others who are involved in this. Look, all of you are going to be senior officials in the next administration, uh, whether that's in in two years or, or six years. And, and we've got a great great group of people in this country that understand the threats we're facing and are going to guide our policy as we you know, address those threats and, and, and rise to the challenges we face from communist China. But I think there's a third thing that we're not focusing on, and that's the Chinese people. You know, they're an amazing people. You know, our, our, our concern is with the Communist Party of China, this totalitarian regime that keeps them under their thumb. And, and we saw the 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 longing for freedom in Tiananmen Square. We, we saw it with the, the brave people of Hong Kong, you know, Chinese uh, in Hong Kong coming out with their blank papers. I mean, we've, we've seen the, 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 the tank man and others. And, and when we think about the relentlessness and the cleverness and the, and the hardworking nature of the Chinese people, and we're concerned about it now, I also want to think about the time when, when they're liberated and when they have freedom. And, and how great that's going to be for humanity as a whole. I mean, can you imagine a, a free China contributing all the things that they have to offer, not, not, not for evil, but for good? And, and so I, I think one of the things we need to do as Americans is remain, you know, that, that shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan talked about, that beacon of liberty for the Chinese people who, look, they're the worst recipients of the, of the, the totalitarian control society you know, they, they, they're, they're walking around with credit scores and, and under surveillance 24-7 under lockdowns. They're the ones who are the biggest victims of the Communist Party of China. You know, the, the, the CCP would love to do it to us if they could. They're not going to be able to because it's more Americans. But, but, but one day China will be free. And, and, you know, when we think about interplanetary travel and quantum computing and AI and all the, all the great things that can happen in this world, think about China being a, a force for good. And so, so I'm optimistic. I think we're going to win these things in the end and win this adversarial competition in the end. And I think we've got great things to look forward to. But but going back to your question, there is a sense of urgency. We have to act now and we have to take action this day. And, and I, I think we will. I'd like to see more action out of the administration, but like Bridge, I'll compliment them where they've done some good things on the CHIPS Act and, and the sanctions, but we need to do more and we need to do it on a bipartisan basis. And, and that's going to be good, not just for America, but it's going to be good for China and the Chinese people. And, and I look forward to seeing that day when when the promise of Tiananmen Square, which we all watched as, as younger people, uh, is fulfilled and, and, and the Chinese do get their freedom and their liberty. And that's going to be a great day for, for humanity as a whole. Well, that's a, a great way to close. I 
do want to thank our chair, Ambassador O'Brien, tonight, all of the seminar members who participated, the Nixon Foundation team, and of course, all of you for watching. Please follow us across social media podcasts. We're on TV. We're on radio. We love to hear from you. But that's it for this month's Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. I'm Mary Kissel. Good night.